Naked Empire by Terry Goodkind, continuing on page 595. Richard snatched up his pack. He didn't see Kaylin, but saw her pack and grabbed it as well. He wondered if he might still be dreaming, but he never remembered his dreams. He wondered if the feeling might be some lingering dread from a dream. No, it was real. At first made confused and indecisive by Richard's sudden commands, when the men saw him urgently picking up his gear, everyone scooped up their things and scrambled to their feet. Men everywhere were snatching anything they saw lying about, no matter whose it was. Move, Richard yelled as he pushed hesitant men toward the door. Go! Move! 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 It felt as if something brushed against him. A sliding caress of his flesh, something warm and wicked. Goosebumps tingled up his arms. Hurry! Men scrambled wildly up the dark stairs ahead of him. Betty, caught up in the mood of panicked escape, shot between his legs and ran up the steps. Kara was close behind him. The hair at the nape of his neck prickled as if lightning was about to strike. Richard scanned the dark, empty room. Where's Kalen and Jensen? They went outside before, Kara said. Good. Let's go. Just as Richard reached the top of the stairs, a fiery blast from back in the room knocked him sprawling. Kara fell on his legs. The stairwell lit in a flash of yellow and orange light as the entire basement filled with flames. Gouts of fire rolled up the stairwell. Richard seized Kara's arm and dove with her through the open doorway. As they burst out into the night, the building behind them erupted in a thunderous roar of flames. Parts of the building broke apart, lifting in the billowing blaze. Richard and Kara ducked as flaming boards fell all around them, bouncing and flipping across the ground lit by the glow. Finally away from the burning building, Richard made a quick appraisal of the alley, looking to see if there were any soldiers about to set upon them. Not seeing anyone he didn't recognize, he started the men moving down the alley to put some distance between them and the burning building. We have to get away from here, Richard told Anson. Nicholas knew we were here. The fire will draw attention and troops. We haven't much time. Looking around, he still didn't see Kalen anywhere. His concern rising, he spotted Jensen, Tom, and Owen running up the alley toward him. By the looks on their faces, he immediately knew that something was wrong. Richard seized Jensen's arm as she ran up close. Where's Kalen? Jensen gulped air. Richard, she, she. Jensen burst into tears. Owen waved a square-sided bottle and a piece of paper as he too wept uncontrollably. Richard looked at Tom, expecting an answer and fast. What's going on? Nicholas found the antidote. He offered it in trade for the mother confessor. We tried to stop her, Lord Rawl. I swear we did. She wouldn't listen to any of us. She insisted that she was going to get the antidote and then stop Nicholas. After you have the antidote, if she fails to stop Nicholas and return, she wants you to come for her. The leaping flames lit the grim faces around him. Once her mind is made up, Tom added, there's no talking her out of it. She has a way of making you do as she says. Richard knew the truth of that. Amid the roar and crackle of the fire, the building groaned and popped. The roof began to fall in, sending showers of sparks skyward. Owen urgently handed the square-sided bottle to Richard. Lord Rawl, she did it to get the antidote. She wanted you to have it so you could be well. She said that comes first, before it is too late. Richard pulled the cork on the bottle. It had the slight aroma of cinnamon. He took the first swallow, expecting a thick, sweet, spicy taste. It didn't taste that way at all. He looked at Jensen's and Owen's faces. This is water. Jensen's eyes went wide. What? Water. Water with a little cinnamon in it. Richard poured it on the ground. It's not the antidote. She traded herself to Nicholas for nothing. Jensen, Owen, and Tom stood in mute shock. Richard felt a kind of detached calm. It was over. It was the end of everything. He now had a limited amount of time to do what had to be done, and then everything was at an end for him. Let me see this note, he said to Owen. Owen handed it over. 
Richard had no trouble reading by the light coming from the fire. As Kara, Tom, Jensen, and Owen watched, he read it over three times. Finally, his arm lowered. Kara snatched the note away and read it for herself. Richard gazed up the alleyway at the burning building, trying to figure it out. How did Nicholas know that someone was coming for the antidote? He said we had an hour. How did he know we were here, this close, and coming for it, in order to write in the note that he gave us an hour? Maybe he didn't, Kara said. Maybe he wrote the note days ago. Maybe he just wrote that to make us rush without thinking. Maybe, Richard gestured behind him. But how did he know we were here? Magic, Jensen offered. Richard didn't like the idea that Nicholas apparently knew so much and was always one step ahead of them. How did you know that Nicholas was about to set this place ablaze? Kara asked him. I woke suddenly, Richard said. My headache was gone and I just knew we had to get out at once. So your gift worked? I guess so. It does that. It works sometimes to warn me. He wished he could somehow make it more dependable. At least this time it had been, or they would all be dead. Tom peered out into the night. So you think Nicholas is close? That he knew where we were and set the place afire? No. I think he wants us to believe he's close. He's a wizard. He could have sent wizard's fire from a great distance. I'm no expert on magic. He might have used some other means to set the fire from a distance. Richard turned to Owen. Take me to this building where you hid the antidote, where Nicholas was when you first saw him. Without hesitation, Owen started out. The rest of the small group followed after him. Do you think she will be there? Jensen asked. There's only one way to find out. By the time they reached the river, they were out of breath. Richard was furious to find the bridge gone, with stone blocks from it scattered on the banks far below. The rest of it had apparently vanished beneath the dark water. Owen and some of the other men said that there was another bridge farther to the north, so they took off in that direction, following the road that twisted along beside the river. Before they reached the bridge, a knot of soldiers rushed out from a side street with weapons raised, yelling battle cries. The night rang with the distinctive sound of Richard's sword being drawn. While the blade was free, its magic was not. With the heart-pounding threat, it didn't matter. Richard had anger to spare and met the enemy with a cry of his own. The first man lunged. Richard's strike was so violent it cleaved the burly man down through the leather armor over his shoulder to his opposite hip. As Richard spun without pause to a soldier coming at him from behind, he brought the sword around with such speed that the man was beheaded before he had cocked his sword arm. Richard drew his elbow back, smashing the face of a man rushing in to stab him from behind. A quick thrust took down another man before Richard could turn to finish the man behind, who had dropped to his knees, his hands covering his bleeding face. A moonlit flash of Richard's sword brought measured death. Tom slashed through the men at the same time as Kara's Aegeel took others down. Cries of surprised pain shattered the quiet of the night. All the while, Richard swept through the enemy like a wind-borne shadow. In mere moments, the night was again silent. Richard, Tom, and Kara had eliminated the enemy squad before any of their men could react to the threat that had come out of the darkness. Scarcely had they caught their breath when Richard was already charging onward to the bridge. When they reached it, two slouching Imperial Order soldiers stood guard, Pike standing upright, the guards seemed to be surprised that people would be running toward them at night, probably because the people of Bandakar had never before dared to cause them any trouble. The two guards stood watching Richard come until he pulled his sword from behind and took them down with a rapid thrust to the first man and a powerful sweeping slice that cut the second in two along with the pike standing at his side. The small company raced unopposed across the bridge and into the darkness among the crowded buildings. Owen directed Richard at every turn as they rushed onward toward the place where Owen had hidden the antidote, and where he had recovered, instead of the antidote, the note demanding Kalin in exchange for Richard's life, in exchange for the lives of an empire naked to the dark talents of Nicholas the Slide. 
in the somber heart of the city made up of small, squat, mostly single-story buildings, Owen pulled Richard to a stop. Lord Rall, down here at the corner, we turn to the right. A short distance beyond is a square where people often gather. At the far end of the square will be a building taller than those around it. That is the place. Down a small street to the side of it, there will be an alleyway that runs behind the building. That is the way I got in before. Richard nodded. Let's go. Without waiting to see if the tired men were with him, he started out, keeping in close to the buildings, to the shadows cast by the moon. Richard moved around the building at the corner. Hung over a small front window was a carved sign displaying loaves of bread. It was still too early for the baker to be at work. Richard looked up and froze. There before him was the square with trees and benches. The building across the open square was in ruin. Only smoldering timbers remained. A small crowd had gathered around, watching what had hours ago obviously been a large fire. Dear spirits, Jensen whispered in horror. She covered her mouth, fearing to speak aloud the worry on everyone's mind. She wouldn't be in there, Richard said in answer to the unspoken fear. Nicholas wouldn't take her back here just to kill her. Then why do this? Anson asked. Why burn the place down? Richard watched the wisps of smoke slowly curling up into the cool night air at his hopes disappearing. To send me a message that he has her and I'll not find her. Lord Rall, Kara said under her breath, I think we had better get out of here. From the darkness around the building that had burned down, Richard could just start to make out the sight of soldiers by the hundreds, no doubt waiting to catch them. I feared as much, Owen said. That's why I brought us in by such a circuitous route. See that road over there, where all the soldiers are? That's the road coming from the bridge we crossed. How do they always know where we are, or where we will be? Jensen whispered in frustration. And when? Kara grabbed Richard's shirt and started pulling him back. There are too many. We don't know how many more are around us. We need to get out of here. Richard was loath to admit it, but she was right. We have men waiting for us, Tom reminded him, and a lot more coming. Richard's mind raced. Where was she? Finally, he nodded. The instant he did, Kara took him by his arm, and they dashed off into the darkness. Chapter 59 under the sweep of stars, Richard willed himself to stand up straight and tall before all the men gathered beneath the spreading branches of the oak trees at the forest's edge. A few candles burned among the gathering so they could all see. By the time they charged into the city of Northwick to make their attack, it would just be light. Richard wanted nothing more than to get into the city and find Kalin, but he had to use everything he had at hand to help, or he might waste the chance. He had to do this first. Most of these men had never really fought before. Owen and Anson's men from the town of Witherton had been there at the first attack on the sleeping houses and had taken part in the skirmishes there. The rest of the men were from Northwick, where Richard had gone to see the wise one. They had been in on the clashes with the soldiers who weren't poisoned. There had not been a great many enemy soldiers to fight, but the men had done what had to be done. If anything, those minor but bloody encounters had served only to make the men more determined, showing them that they could win freedom themselves, that they were in control of their own destiny. This, though, was different. This was going to be a battle on a scale they had not experienced. Worse, it was in a city that had, for the most part, willingly joined with the Order's cause. The populace was not likely to offer much help. Had he more time, Richard might have come up with a better plan that would have chipped away at the enemy's numbers first, but there was no time. It had to be now. Richard stood before the men, hoping to give them something to help them carry the day. He had trouble thinking of anything but finding Kalen. In order to have the best chance to save her, he put her from his mind and focused on the task at hand. I had hoped we wouldn't have to do it this way, he said. I had hoped we could do it in some manner like we've done before, with the fire or the poisoning, so that none of you would be hurt. We don't have that option. 
Nicholas knows we're here. If we run, his men will come after us. Some of us might escape for a while. We are finished running, Anson said. That's right, Owen agreed. We have learned that running and hiding brings only greater suffering. Richard nodded. I agree. But you must understand that some of us are probably going to die today. Maybe most of us. Maybe all of us. If any of you choose not to fight, then we must know now. Once we go in, we'll all be depending on each other. He clasped his hands behind his back as he paced slowly before them. It was hard to make out their faces in the dim light. Richard knew, too, that his time was running out. His sight would only get worse. His dizziness would only get worse. He knew he was never going to get better. If he was to have a chance to get Kalin away from the men of the Order, it had to be at once, with these men or without them. When none said they wanted to quit, Richard went on. We need to get to their commanders for two reasons. To find out where the Mother Confessor is being held, and to eliminate them so that they can't direct their soldiers against us. You all have weapons now, and in the limited time we've had, we've done our best to teach you how to use them. There's one other thing you must know. You will be afraid. So will I. To overcome this fear, you must use your anger. Anger? One of the men asked. How can we bring forth anger when we're afraid? These men have raped your wives, your sisters, your mothers, daughters, aunts, cousins, and neighbors, Richard said as he paced. Think about that when you look into the enemy's eyes as they come at you. They have taken most of the women away. You all know why. They have tortured children to make you give up. Think about the terror of your children as they screamed in fear and pain, dying bloody and alone after being mutilated by these men. The heat of Richard's anger seeped into his words. Think about that when you see their confident grins as they come at you. These men have tortured people you loved, people who never did anything against them. Think about that as these men come at you with their blood-stained hands. These men have sent many of your people away to be used as slaves. Many more of your people have been murdered by these men. Think about that when they come to murder you too. This is not about a difference of opinion or a disagreement. There can be no debate or uncertainty about this among moral men. This is about rape, torture, murder. Richard turned and faced the men. Think about that when you face these beasts. He tapped a fist to his chest as he ground his teeth. And when you face these men, men who have done all these things to you and your loved ones, face them with hate in your hearts. Fight them with hate in your hearts. Kill them with hate in your hearts. They deserve no better. The woods were silent as the men considered his chilling words. Richard knew that he had rage enough and hate enough to be eager to get at the men of the Imperial Order. He didn't know where Kaelin was, but he intended to find out and to have her back. She had done as she had to in order to get the antidote to save his life. He understood what she had done and couldn't fault her for it. That was the kind of woman she was. She loved him just as fiercely as he loved her. She had done what she had to do. But he was not going to let her down. She was depending on him to come for her. The terrible irony was that it had all been for nothing. The antidote she had made such a sacrifice to obtain was no antidote at all. Richard looked out at all their faces, so intent on what he had to tell them on the eve of such a momentous battle, and remembered then the words on the statue at the entrance to this land, the words of the wizard's eighth rule, Talga Vasternich. There is one last thing to tell you, he said, the most important thing of all. Richard faced them as the leader of the Daharan Empire, an empire struggling to survive, to be free, and told them those two words in their language. Deserve victory. It was just turning light as they charged into the city. Only one of them had remained behind, Jensen. 
Richard had forbidden her from joining the fight. Besides being young and not nearly as strong as the men they would come up against, she would only create a tempting target. Rape was a sacred weapon of the wicked, and one this enemy used religiously. The men of the Imperial Order would rally for such a prize. Kara was different. She was a trained warrior and more lethal than any of them except Richard. Jensen hadn't been pleased to be left behind, but she had understood Richard's reasons and hadn't wanted to give him anything else to worry about. She and Betty had remained behind in the woods. A man they had sent out to scout because he knew the area well emerged from a side alley. As they reached him, they all moved up against the wall, trying to remain out of sight as best they could. I found them, the scout said, trying to catch his breath. He pointed to the right of their route into the city. How many? Richard asked. I think it must be their main force within the city, Lord Rall. It's where they sleep. They seem to still be there as you expected and not yet up. The place they've taken over contains buildings for city offices and administration. But I bring troubling news as well. They are being protected by the people of the city. Richard ran his fingers back through his hair. He had to concentrate to keep from coughing. He gripped the window frame of the building beside him to help himself stand. What do you mean they are being protected? There are crowds of people from the city surrounding the place occupied by the soldiers. The people are there to protect the soldiers from us. They are there to stop us from attacking. Richard let out an angry breath. All right. He turned back to the worried, expectant faces of all the men. Now listen to me. We are joined in a battle against evil. If anyone sides with evil, if they protect evil men, then they are serving to perpetuate evil. One of the men looked unsure. Are you saying that if they try to stop us, we might have to use force against them? What is it these people seek to accomplish? What is their goal? They want to prevent us from eliminating the imperial order. Because they hate life, they despise freedom more than slavery. With grim determination, Richard met the men's gazes. I'm saying that anyone who protects the enemy and seeks to keep them in power for whatever reason has sided with them. It's no more complicated than that. If they try to protect the enemy or hamper us from doing as we must, kill them. But they aren't armed, a man said. Richard's anger flared. They are armed, armed with evil ideas that seek to enslave the world. If they succeed, you die. Saving the lives of innocent people and your loved ones and having far less loss of life in the end is best served by crushing the enemy as decisively and quickly as possible. Then there will be peace. If these people try to prevent that, then they are in effect siding with those who torture and murder. They help them to live another day to murder again. Such people must not be treated any differently than what they in truth are servants of evil. If they try to stop you, kill them. There was a moment of silence, then Anson put a fist to his heart. With hate in my heart, vengeance without mercy. Looks of iron determination spread back through the men. They all put fists to their hearts in salute and took up the pledge. Vengeance without mercy! Richard clapped Anson on the side of the shoulder. Let's go. They raced out from the long shadows of the buildings and poured around the corner. The people off at the end of the street all turned when they spotted Richard's force coming. More people, men and women from the city, surged into the street in front of the compound of buildings the soldiers had taken up as barracks and a command post. The people looked like a scraggly lot. No war! No war! No war! The people shouted as Richard led the men up the street at a dead run. Out of the way, Richard yelled as he closed the distance. This was no time for subtlety or discussions. The success of their attack depended in large part on speed. Get out of the way. This is your only warning. Get out of the way or die. Stop the hate. Stop the hate, the people chanted as they locked arms. They had no idea how much hate was raging through Richard. He drew the sword of truth. The wrath of its magic didn't come out with it, but he had enough of his own. He slowed to a trot. Move, Richard called as he bore down on the people. 
A plump, curly-haired woman took a step out from the others. Her round face was red with anger as she screamed, Stop the hate! No war! Stop the hate! No war! Move or die, Richard yelled as he picked up speed. The red-faced woman shook her fleshy fist at Richard and his men, leading an angry chant. Murderers! 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 On his way past her, gritting his teeth as he screamed with the fury of the attack begun, Richard took a powerful swing, lopping off the woman's head and upraised arm. Strings of blood and gore splashed across the faces behind her even as some still chanted their empty words. The head and loose arm tumbled through the crowd. A man made the mistake of reaching for Richard's weapon and took the full weight of a charging thrust. Men behind Richard hit the line of evil's guardians with unrestrained violence. People armed only with their hatred for moral clarity fell bloodied, terribly injured, and dead. The line of people collapsed before the merciless charge. Some of the people, screaming their content, used their fists to attack Richard's men. They were met with swift and deadly steel. At the realization that their defense of the Imperial Order's brutality would actually result in consequences to themselves, the crowd began scattering in fright, screaming curses back at Richard and his men. Richard's army did not pause as they tore through the ring of protectors, now on the run, but continued on to the maze of buildings among grassy open spaces dotted with trees. The soldiers who were outside began to realize that this time they would have to protect themselves, that the people of the city could no longer do it for them. These were men used to slaughtering defenseless, docile victims. For more than a year of occupation, they had not had to fight. Richard was the first on them, taking down men on his way into their midst. Kara charged in at his right, Tom at his left, the deadly point of a spear driving into soldiers only now pulling free their weapons. These were men used to overwhelming their cowering opponents with sheer numbers, not with fighting resolute opposition. They did so now and for their lives. Richard moved through them as if they were statues. They thrust a blade at where he had been while he cut where they were going and met them there with razor-sharp steel. He came up behind others as they looked both ways, losing track of him only to have him reach around and draw his sword across their throats. Others he beheaded before they realized he was about to strike. He wasted no effort with exaggerated movements and wild slashes. He cut with deadly proficiency. He didn't try to best men to show them he was better. He simply killed them. He didn't give them any chance to fight back. He cut them down before they could. Now that he was committed to the fight, he was committed to the dance with death, which meant one thing, cut. It was his duty, his purpose, his hunger to cut the enemy down quickly, resolutely, and utterly. They were not prepared for this level of violence unleashed. As his men fell on the soldiers, a great cry rose up. As men fell, their screams filled the morning. Seeing a man who looked like an officer, Richard wheeled around him and laid his blade across the man's throat. Where is Nicholas and the mother confessor? The man answered by trying to grab Richard's arm. He wasn't nearly quick enough. Richard pulled his sword across the man's throat, nearly severing his head, as he spun to a man coming at him from behind. The man skidded to a stop in an effort to avoid Richard's blade, only to be stabbed through the heart. The battle raged on, moving back between the buildings as they took down those men who met the attack. Yet more men, layered in leather, mail, hides, and weapon belts, came out of the barracks at hearing the clash. They were fierce-looking men, looking better suited to murder than any man Richard had ever seen. As they came onward, Richard seized anyone who looked like an officer. None of them were able to give him an answer. None of them knew the whereabouts of either Nicholas or Kalin. Richard had to fight off the dizziness as well as the soldiers. By focusing on the dance with death and the precepts the sword had taught him in the past, he was able to surmount the effects of the poison. He knew that such efforts couldn't long replace the required strength of endurance, but for the moment, he was able to do as he had to. It was somewhat surprising to see how well his men were doing. They helped one another as they moved deeper into the enemy lines. By fighting in that way, 
using one another's strengths, they were often able to survive together where one alone would not have. Some of his men had not survived. Richard saw several lying dead, but the surprised enemy was being slaughtered. The Imperial Order soldiers were not charged with righteous, resolute determination. Richard's men were. The Order soldiers were little more than a gang of thugs allowed to run loose. They now faced men calling them to account. The men of the Order fought a disorderly attempt to spare their own individual lives without thought to a coordinated defense, while Richard's men fought to a singular purpose of exterminating the enemy's entire force. Richard heard Kara calling urgently for him from the narrow space between two buildings. At first he thought she was in trouble, but when he rounded the corner he saw then that she had a husky man on his knees. She held his head up by a fistful of his greasy black hair. One ear displayed a row of silver rings. Kara had her Aegeal at his throat. Blood ran down his chin. Tell him, she yelled at the man when Richard ran up. I don't know where they are. In a fit of fury, Kara slammed the tip of her Aegeal to the base of the man's skull. He flinched, his arms shaking with a shattering shock of pain that brought a gasp rather than a scream. His eyes rolled back in his head. Holding him by his tangled hair, Kara bent him back over her knee to hold him upright. Tell him, she growled. They left, he mumbled. Nicholas left last night. They carried a woman away with them but I don't know who she was. Richard went to a knee and grabbed the man's shirt. What did she look like? The man's eyes were still rolling. Long hair. Where did they go? Don't know. Gone in a hurry. What did Nicholas tell you before he left? The man's eyes slowly came into focus. Nicholas knew you were going to attack at dawn. He told me the route you would take into the city. Richard could hardly believe what he was hearing. How could he possibly know that? He hesitated. The sight of Kara's Aegeal made him talk. I don't know. Before he left, Nicholas told me how many men you had, told me when you would attack and by which route. He told me to get people from the city to shield us from your attack. We gathered our most fanatical supporters and told them that you were coming to murder us, that you wanted to make war. When did Nicholas leave? Where did he take this woman? Blood dripped from the man's chin. I don't know. They just left in a hurry last night. That's all I know. If you knew we were coming, why didn't you make a better defense? Oh, but we did. Nicholas told me to take care of the city. I assured him that such a small force as yours cannot possibly defeat us. Something was terribly wrong. Why not? For the first time, the man smiled. Because you don't know how many men we really have. Once I knew where your attack was coming, I was able to call in all my forces. The man's smile widened. Do you hear that horn in the distance? Here they come. A belly laugh rolled up. You are about to die. Richard gritted his teeth. You first. With a mighty thrust, he ran his sword through the officer's heart. The man's eyes widened in shock. Richard gave the blade a twist as he withdrew it to be sure the job was done. We'd better get the men out of here, Richard said as he took Kara's arm and ran for the corner of the buildings. Looks like we're too late, she said when they came out from behind cover and saw the legions of men pouring in all around them. How did Nicholas know when and where they were going to attack? There had been no one around, no races. Not so much as a mouse had been there when they had made their plans as they moved through the countryside. How could he have known? Dear spirits, Kara said, I didn't think they had this many men in Bandakar. The roar of the soldiers was deafening as they charged in. Richard was already spent. Each deep breath he pulled was agonizingly painful. He knew that there was no choice. He had to find a way to get to Kalen. He had to hold out at least that long. Richard whistled in a signal to gather his men. As Anson and Owen ran up, Richard looked around and saw most of the others. We have to try to break out of here. There's too many of them. Stay together. We're going to try to punch through. 
If we make it, scatter and try to make it back to the forest. With Kara at one side, Tom at the other, Richard charged at the head of his men toward the enemy lines. Thousands of the Imperial Order soldiers poured out from the city around them and into the open. It was a frightening sight. There were so many that it almost seemed as if the ground itself were moving. Before Richard reached the soldiers, the morning suddenly lit with blinding blasts of fire. Thunderous eruptions of flame tore through the enemy lines, killing men by the hundreds. Sawed trees and men were hurled into the air. Men, their clothes, hair, and flesh burning, tumbled across the ground. Richard heard a howl coming from behind. It sounded somehow familiar. He turned just in time to see a roiling ball of liquid yellow flame wailing through the air toward them. It expanded as it came, tumbling with seething, deadly intensity. Wizard's fire. The incandescent, white-hot inferno roared by just overhead. Once past Richard and his men, it descended, crashing down among the enemy soldiers, spilling a flood of liquid death out among them. Wizard's fire stuck to what it touched, burning with ferocious intensity. A single droplet of it would burn down through a man's leg to the bone. It was horrifyingly deadly. It was said to be so excruciatingly painful that those who lived longed only for death. The question was, who was it coming from? To the other side, men of the order fell as something scythed through their ranks. It almost looked as if a single blade cut them down by the hundreds, ripping them apart with bloody ferocity. But who was doing it? There was no time to stand around and wonder. Richard and his men had to turn to meet the soldiers who made it through the devastating conjuring. Now that their numbers had been so thinned, the Imperial Order soldiers were unable to mount an effective attack. Their charge fell apart on the blades of Richard's men. As they fought, more deadly fire came in to catch those trying to run, or those who massed to attack. In other places, Order soldiers fell without Richard or his men touching them. They gasped in great agony, clutching their chests, and fell dead. Before long, the morning fell silent but for the groans of the wounded. Richard's men rallied around him, unsure of what had happened, worried that whatever had befallen these men might suddenly turn and befall them as well. Richard realized that they didn't see the attack of wizard's fire and magic in the same way as he did. To them, it must seem a miracle of salvation. Richard spotted two people beside one of the buildings off to the side of the grounds. One was taller than the other. He squinted, trying to make them out, but he just couldn't see who they were. With a hand on Tom's shoulder for support, they headed toward the two figures. Richard, my boy, Nathan said when Richard made it over to him. So good to find you well. Anne, a squat woman in a plain gray dress, smiled that knowing smile of hers, so filled with joy, satisfaction, and at the same time a kind of knowing tolerance. I doubt you two could imagine how glad I am to see you, Richard said, still catching his breath, trying not to breathe too deeply. But what are you doing here? How in the world did you find me? Nathan leaned in with a sly smile. Prophecy, my boy. Nathan wore high boots and a ruffled white shirt with a vest and an elegant green velvet cape attached at his right shoulder. The prophet cut quite the figure. Richard saw then that Nathan was wearing an exquisite sword in a polished scabbard. It seemed to Richard rather odd for a wizard who could command wizard's fire to carry a sword. It seemed even more odd to see the man abruptly draw the weapon. Anne suddenly gasped as someone sprang from behind the building and grabbed her. It was one of the people from the city who had gathered to protect the army, a tall, slender, pinch-faced woman with a formidable scowl and a long knife. You are murderers, she cried, her straight hair whipping side to side. You are filled with hate. The ground around Anne and the woman erupted, chunks of dirt and grass flying up into the air. Anne, a sorceress, was apparently trying to fight off her attacker. The woman was unaffected. Against a pristinely ungifted person, magic wasn't working. 
Nathan, not far to the side of Anne, stepped in and without ado, ran the tall woman through with his sword. The woman staggered back, his sword through her chest, her face a picture of surprise. She dropped, sliding off the red blade. Anne, free of her attacker, glanced at the dead woman. She fixed Nathan in a scowl. Dashing indeed, Nathan smiled at her private joke. I told you they aren't touched by magic. Nathan, Richard said, I still don't understand. Come here, my dear, Nathan said, signaling off behind him. Jensen ran out from behind the building. She threw her arms around Richard. I'm so glad you're all right, she said. I hope you aren't angry with me. Nathan showed up in the woods not long after you and the men left. I remembered seeing him before, at the People's Palace in Dahara. I knew he was a Rall, so I told him the trouble we were in. He and Anne wanted to help. We came as fast as we could. Jensen looked expectantly up at Richard. He answered her worry with a hug. You did the right thing, he told her. You used your head for something the orders didn't anticipate. Now that the heat of battle had ended, Richard was dizzier than ever. He had to lean on Tom for support. Nathan put a shoulder under Richard's other arm. I hear you're having trouble with your gift. Maybe I can help. I don't have time. Nicholas the Slide has Kaylin. I have to find her or... Don't play a fool when you aren't, Nathan said. It won't take long to bring your gift into harmony. You need the help of another wizard to get it under control, like the last time I helped you, or you won't be of any use to anyone. Come on, let's get you inside one of these places where it's quiet. Then I can take care of that much of your troubles. Richard wanted nothing more than to find Kalin, but he didn't know where to look. He felt like falling into the man's arms and surrendering his destiny to him, to his experience, to his vast knowledge. Richard knew Nathan was right, he felt like crying with relief that help was finally at hand. Who better to help him get his gift back under control than a wizard? Richard had never even dared to hope to have this opportunity. He had planned on trying to get to Nietzsche because she was the only one he could think of who might know what to do. This was infinitely better than a sorceress helping him. A wizard was the only one really meant to help with this kind of trouble with another wizard's gift. Just make it quick, he told Nathan. Nathan smiled that raw smile of his. Come on, then. We'll have your gift back to right in no time at all. Thank you, Nathan, Richard mumbled as he let the big man help him through a nearby doorway. Chapter 60 Richard sat cross-legged on the wood floor facing Nathan. The barren room had no furniture. Nathan said none was needed, that the floor was fine with him. Anne, not far away, sat on the floor as well. Richard was a little surprised that Nathan was allowing her to observe, but didn't question it. There was the possibility that he might want to have her help for some part of it. Everyone else waited outside. Kara wasn't happy about allowing Richard out of her sight, but Richard calmed her concern by telling her that he would feel more comfortable and able to concentrate on correcting the problem with his gift if he knew she was outside keeping an eye on everything for him. The two windows had been shuttered, allowing in only dim light and keeping out most of the noise. With his hands on his knees, the prophet pushed his back straighter and, drawing a deep breath, seemed to pull an aura of authority around himself. Nathan was the one who had first taught Richard about his gift, telling him how war wizards like Richard weren't like other wizards. Instead of tapping the core of power within themselves, they directed their intent through their feelings. It had been a difficult concept to grasp. Nathan had told Richard that his power worked through anger. Lose yourself in my eyes, Nathan said in a quiet voice. Richard knew he had to try to put his worry for Kalin aside. Trying to keep his breathing steady so as not to cough, he stared into Nathan's hooded, deep, dark azure eyes. Nathan's gaze drew him in. Richard felt as if he were falling up into the clear blue sky. His breath came in ragged pulls, and not of his own doing. He felt Nathan's commanding words more than heard them. Call forth the anger, Richard. 
Call forth the rage. Call forth the hate and fury. Richard's head was swimming. He concentrated on calling his anger. He thought about Nicholas having Kalen, and he had no trouble summoning rage. He could feel another force within his own, as if he were drowning and someone were trying to hold his head above water. He drifted alone in a dark and still place. Time seemed to mean nothing. Time. He had to get to Kalen in time. He was her only chance. Richard opened his eyes. Nathan, I'm sorry, but Nathan was drenched in sweat. Anne was sitting beside him, holding Richard's left hand, Nathan his right. Richard wondered what had happened. Richard looked from one face to the other. What's wrong? They both looked grim. We tried, Nathan whispered. I'm sorry, but we tried. Richard frowned. They had only just begun. What do you mean? Why are you giving up so soon? Nathan cast a sidelong glance at Anne. We've been at it for two hours, Richard. Two hours? I'm afraid there is nothing I can do, my boy. By the sound of his voice, he meant it. Richard ran his fingers back through his hair. What are you talking about? You're the one who told me the last time when I had this problem, joining with a wizard would set it straight. You said it was a simple matter for a wizard to fix such a disharmony with the gift. That's the way it should be, but your gift is somehow tangled up into a knot that's strangling you. But you're a prophet, a wizard, and you're a sorceress. Together you both probably know more about magic than anyone who has lived in thousands of years. Richard, there has not been another born like you in the last three thousand years. We don't know that much about how your particular gift works. Anne paused to push stray strands of gray hair back into the bun at the back of her head. We tried, Richard. I swear to you, we both tried our best. Your gift is beyond Nathan's help, even with my ability enhancing his power. We tried everything we know, and even a few things we thought up. None of it had any effect. We cannot help you. So what must I do? Nathan's azure eyes turned away. Your gift is killing you, Richard. I don't know the cause. But I'm afraid that it has spiraled into a phase that is out of control and fatal. Anne's eyes were wet. Richard, I'm so sorry. Richard looked from one distraught face to the other. I guess it doesn't really matter, Richard said. Nathan frowned. What do you mean it doesn't matter? Richard rose up, groping for the wall to keep his balance. I've been poisoned. The antidote is gone. There is no cure. I'm afraid that I'm running out of time. I guess the joke is on my gift. Something else is going to get me first. Anne stood and gripped his upper arms. Richard, we can't help you right now, but you can at least rest while we try to figure out... No, Richard waved off her concern. No, I can't waste what little time I have left. I have to get to Kalen. Anne cleared her throat. Richard, at the Palace of the Prophets, Nathan and I waited for your birth for a very long time. We worked to clear those obstacles that prophecy showed us lay in your path. The prophecies name you as central to the course of the future of the world. In fact, they say you are the only one with a chance. We need you to lead us in this battle. We don't know what is wrong with your gift, but we can work on it. You must be here so that if we come up with a solution, we can set your power right. I'll not live for you to cure me, don't you see? The poison is killing me. It has three states. I'm already entering the third state, blindness. I'm going to die. I must use what time I have left to find Kalen. You aren't going to have me to lead you, but if I can get her away from Nicholas, you will have her to lead the struggle in my place. You know where she is then, Nathan asked. Richard realized that in the state of focused, concentrated thought, as he was adrift in that quiet place while Nathan was trying to help him, it had come to him where Nicholas most likely had taken Kalen. He had to get there while Nicholas was still there with her. Yes, I believe I do. Richard pulled open the door. Kara, sitting right outside, shot to her feet. 
Her expectant expression quickly withered when he shook his head, signaling that it hadn't worked. We have to get going, right away. I think I know where Nicholas took Kalen. We have to hurry. You know? Jensen asked, holding Betty close by the rope. Yes. We need to leave at once. Where is she then? Jensen asked. Richard gestured. Oh, and remember how you told us about a fortified encampment the Imperial Order built when they first came to Bandakar, and they were worried about their safety? Back near my town, Owen said. Richard nodded. That's right. I think Nicholas took Kalen there. It's a secure place they built to hold some of the women captive. There would be plenty of soldiers to protect him, and it's the kind of place built specifically to be defensible, so it would be much more difficult to approach than his place here in the city. Then how will we approach it? Jensen asked. We'll have to figure that out once we get there and see the place. Nathan joined Richard at the door. Anne and I will go with you. We might be able to help rescue Kalen from the slide. While we travel, the two of us can work on a solution for untangling your gift. Richard gripped Nathan's shoulder. There are no horses in this land. If you can run and keep up with us, you're welcome. But I can't afford to slow for you. I don't have much time, and neither does Kalen. Nicholas will not likely hold her there long. After he pauses for rest and supplies and then leaves this land, it will be even more difficult to find him. We have no time to lose. We're going to have to travel as swiftly as possible. Nathan's eyes turned down in disappointment. Anne drew Richard into a brief hug. We're far too old to keep up the speed afoot that you and these young people can. When you get her away from the slide, come back, and we'll do our best to help you. We'll work on the problem while you're getting her out of his clutches. Come back then, and we'll have a solution. Richard knew that he would never live that long, but there was no point in saying it. All right. What can you tell me about a slide? Nathan drew his thumb along his jaw as he considered the question. Slides are soul stealers. There is no defense against them. Even I would be powerless to stop them. Richard didn't suppose that needed any explanation. Kara, Jensen, Tom, you can come with me. What about us? Owen asked. Anson stood close by, looking eager to be included, and nodded at Owen's suggestion. There were others as well who had stood vigil outside the place where Nathan had tried to help Richard. They were all men who had fought hard. If he was to get Kalen back, he would likely need some men at least. Your help would be welcome. I think most of the men should stay here with Nathan and Anne. The people here in Houghton need to have your men explain everything to them, help them to understand all that you've learned. They will need to make some changes to adjust to interacting with the world out there now open to them. As Richard started away, Nathan grabbed a hold of his sleeve. Richard, as far as I know, you have no defense against a soul stealer. But there is one thing I recall from an old tome in the vaults in the Palace of the Prophets. I'm listening. They somehow travel outside their body, send their own spirit out. Richard rubbed his fingertips across his brow as he thought about Nathan's words. That has to be how he was watching me, tracking me. I believe he watched me through the eyes of huge birds that live here called black-tipped races. If what you're saying is right, then maybe he leaves his body in order to do this. Richard looked up at Nathan. How does this help me? Nathan leaned closer, cocking his head to peer with one azure eye. That is when they are vulnerable, when they are out of their body. Richard lifted his sword a few inches in the scabbard to be sure it was clear. Any idea how to catch him outside of his body? He let the sword drop back. Nathan straightened. Afraid not. Richard nodded his thanks anyway and stepped down out of the doorway. Owen, how far is this fortified encampment? Back close to where the path used to go out through the boundary. That was why Richard hadn't seen it. They had come on the ancient route used by Kajarang. Ordinarily, it would be a journey of well over a week, they didn't have nearly that long. He took in all the faces watching him. Nicholas has quite a head start on us, and he will be in a hurry to escape with his prize. 
If we travel swiftly and don't stop long to rest, there's a good chance we can still catch up with him by the time he reaches their encampment. We need to be on our way at once. We're only waiting for you, Lord Rall, Kara said. So was Kalen. Chapter 61 Each day of hard travel, Richard's condition worsened, but his fear for Kalen drove him relentlessly onward. Most of the time, hour after hour, through sunlight, darkness, and occasional rain, they ran at a steady lope. Richard used a staff he'd cut himself to help keep his balance. When he thought he would be unable to go on, Richard deliberately picked up the pace to remind himself that he could not give up. They stopped at night only long enough to get a few hours sleep. The men had trouble keeping up with him. Kara and Jensen didn't. They were both used to strenuous exertion in the course of difficult journeys. All of them, though, were so exhausted from the unrelenting pace that they talked only when necessary. Richard drove himself doggedly, trying not to think about his own hopeless condition. It didn't matter. He reminded himself that with every step they ran, if it was fast enough, they were gaining on Nicholas and just that much closer to Kalen. In moments of despair, Richard told himself that Kalen had to be alive, that Nicholas could have killed her long ago, if that was his intention. He wouldn't have run if she were dead. Kalen would be much more valuable to him alive. In a way, he felt an odd kind of relief. He could push as hard as he needed. He didn't have to worry about his health. There was no antidote to the poison. Given the time, it would kill him. There was no solution to the problem of his gift being out of control. That, too, would kill him. There was nothing Richard could do about either. He was going to die. The wooded hills were easy enough traveling. They were open with broad green meadows sprinkled with wildflowers and a patchwork of grassland. Wildlife was abundant. Were he not dying in pain and sick with worry for Kalen, Richard might have enjoyed the beauty of the land. Now it was just an obstacle. The sun in his eyes was slipping down behind the towering mountains. Soon darkness would be upon them. A little earlier, Richard had used his bow to take a buck when the opportunity presented itself. Tom had made quick work of butchering it. The rest of them needed to eat, or they would not be able to keep up the pace. Richard supposed that they would have to stop for a while to cook the meat and get some sleep. Owen came up beside Richard as they trotted through a sea of grass rolling beneath the breeze. Owen pointed ahead. There, Lord Rolf. That stream coming out of the hills is getting close to the Order's encampment. Just a little farther over that line of hills and toward the mountains, he pointed to the right. Off that way, not far, is my town of Witherton. Richard changed his course a little to the left, heading for the woods that started at the foot of a gentle rise. They made the trees just as the orange disk of the sun slipped behind the snow-capped mountains. All right, Richard said coming to a breathless halt as they entered a small clearing. Let's set up camp here. Jensen, Tom, why don't you two and the men stay here? Get some meat cooking while I go with Owen and Kara and scout this fortification and see if I can figure out how we're going to get in. When Richard started out using his staff to help balance, Betty started following him. Jensen snatched Betty's rope. Oh, no, you don't, Jensen said. You're staying here. Richard doesn't need you tagging along to attract attention at the worst possible time. What should we make for you to eat, Lord Rall? Tom asked. Richard couldn't stand the thought of eating meat. After all the bloody fighting, he needed to balance his gift more than ever. His gift was killing him, but if he did the wrong thing, it might hasten the end, and then he might not last long enough to get Kalen away from Nicholas. Whatever we have that isn't meat... You have time before we come back, so you can cook some bannock, some rice, maybe some beans. Tom agreed to take care of it, and Richard followed after Owen. Kara, looking more unhappy than he could ever remember seeing her, put a hand on his shoulder. How are you holding up, Lord Rall? He dared not tell her how much pain he was in from the gift, or that he had started to cough up blood. I'm all right for now. By the time they dragged back into their camp almost two hours later, the meat on the spit was finished cooking and some of the men had already eaten. 
They were just curling up in blankets to get some sleep. Richard was beyond being tired. He was certain that they had been close to Kalen. It had been agonizing to have to return, to leave the place where Nicholas held her, but he had to use his head. Wild, irrational action would bring only failure. It would not get Kalen out of there. Richard was being driven by needs beyond food or sleep, but as he watched Owen sit heavily near the fire, he knew that Owen and Kara were exhausted, and he imagined that they had to be hungry. Rather than sit, Kara waited at his side. She would not allow him to get far from her watchful protection, nor would she voice any concern for herself or her needs. He could never have imagined back in the beginning ever feeling this close to a moored Sith. Jensen stood and rushed to meet him. Richard, here, let me help you. Come and sit. Richard flopped down on the grass near the fire. Betty came over and begged a place beside him. He let her lie down. Well, Tom asked, what do you think of the place? I don't know. It has well-made timber walls with trenches dug before them. There are snares and traps all around the place. It has a gate, a real gate. Richard sighed as he rubbed his eyes. His sight was getting blurry. It was getting more difficult all the time to see things. I haven't quite figured it out yet. It was hard to think with the smell of the cooking meat. It was making him sick. Richard took a piece of bannock and the bowl of rice and beans Jensen handed him. He couldn't eat while watching them eat the meat, or worse, smelling it. Richard stood. I'm going to go for a walk. He didn't want to make them feel bad about their dinner or feel guilty for eating meat in front of him. I need some time alone to think it out. Richard gestured for Kara to sit back down and stay where she was. Get some dinner, he told her. I need you to stay strong. Richard walked off through the trees, listening to the chirp of crickets, watching the stars through the canopy of leaves. It was a relief to be alone, not to have people asking him anything. It was tiring to have people always depending on him. Richard found a quiet place where an old oak had fallen. He sat and leaned back against the trunk. He wished he never had to get up. If not for Kalen, he wouldn't. Betty showed up. She stood before him, looking at him intently, as if to ask what they were going to do next. When Richard said nothing, Betty lay down in front of him. It occurred to him that maybe Betty just wanted to offer him some comfort. Richard felt a tear run down his cheek. Everything was falling to pieces. He couldn't hold those pieces together any longer. He could hardly breathe past the lump in his throat. He lay down and put an arm over Betty. What am I going to do? He sniffled. He wiped the back of his hand across his nose. Kalen, what am I going to do? He whispered in forlorn misery. I need you so much. What am I going to do? He was at the end of all hope. He had thought when he'd seen Nathan unexpectedly arrive that help was at hand. The bright ember of that last hope had been extinguished. Not even a powerful wizard could help him. Powerful wizard. Kajaran. Richard froze. The words sent to him by Kajaran, those two words emblazoned across the granite base of that statue, echoed through his mind. Those two words were meant for Richard. Talga Vasternich, deserve victory. Dear spirits, Richard whispered. He understood. Chapter 62 Nicholas watched as Lord Rawl made his way back into the camp among his men after his despairing whispered last prayer to the dear spirits. So sad. So very sad that the man was going to die, he would soon be with his dear spirits in the keeper's realm of the underworld. Nicholas relished the game. The poor Lord Rawl was so lost and confused. Nicholas wished the game could continue for a good long time, but Lord Rawl had little time left. So sad. But it would be much more fun after Lord Rawl died, after that last detail was finally finished. Jagang thought this pathetic man was resourceful. Don't underestimate him, Jagang had warned. Perhaps Jagang was no match for the great Richard Rall, but Nicholas the Slide was. 
His spirit swelled with delight at the expectant thought of Lord Rawl's death. That was going to be something to watch. It would be a grand finale of the play of life. Nicholas intended to see it all, to see every sad moment of the last act. He imagined that Lord Rawl's friends would gather to weep and wail as they stood by, helpless, watching him slip into the welcoming embrace of death, eternity's shepherd, come to help him begin the magnificent, never-ending spiritual journey away from the bitter interlude that had been life. The final curtain was about to draw closed. Nicholas so loved sad endings, he could hardly wait to watch it played out. Hate to live, live to hate. Nicholas wondered, too, as did Lord Rawl, what would get him first, the poison or his gift. It seemed to tug first toward one and then toward the other. For a time, the headaches inflicted by his gift nearly put him down. Then the poison would tighten its pain and make him gasp in agony. It was a fascinating question, one that, as in any good play, would not be answered until the very end. The tension was delicious. Nicholas was rooting for the gift to win the fatal contest. Poison was all well and good, but what a vastly more intriguing twist of fate it would be to see a wizard of Lord Rawl's ability and potential, a wizard unlike any to be born since an era long buried in the dunghill of mankind's history, succumb to his birthright, to his own vast but vain power. Another victim of men reaching too high in life. That would be a fascinating and fitting end. Not long to wait. Not long at all. Nicholas watched, not wanting to miss a single delectable detail. With the spirit of Richard Rawls' lovely bride beside him, as it were, Nicholas felt almost a part of the family as he attended the approach of such a great man's tragic end. Nicholas felt it only fair that the mother confessor should get to see it all played out, see the sad end to her beloved. As she watched along with Nicholas, she was suffering seeing the agony of it as Richard Rawl walked back into his camp. Nicholas savored her distress. He had not yet begun to make her suffer. He would soon have a very long time with her to explore her capacity for suffering. The people there in the woods around the campfire looked up, curious as their master returned among them. They all waited with Nicholas, watching with Nicholas, as their Lord Rawl stood over them. His figure wavered in the fire as it did in Nicholas's vision. It was almost as if he were already but a spirit, about to drift away into the glorious oblivion of the dead. I've figured it out, Lord Rawl told them. I know how to attack the fortification. Nicholas's ears pricked up. What was this? At first light we go in, Lord Rawl said, just as the sun breaks over the mountains. Right then, on the east side, we'll come in over the wall. The guards won't be able to see well because the sun will be in their eyes when they look in that direction. Men don't look where it's troublesome to look. I like it, one of the other men said. So we will sneak in then rather than try to attack, another said. Oh no, there will be an attack, Lord Rawl said. A big attack. An attack that will set their heads to spinning. What was this? What was this? Nicholas watched, watched, watched. This was most curious. First Lord Rawl was going to sneak over the wall, and then he would have his men attack? How was he going to set their heads to spinning? Nicholas was fascinated. He moved in a little closer, fearing to miss a precious word. The attack will involve all the rest of you men, Lord Rawl said. You will all come in toward the gate at first light. While you're attacking through the gate and drawing their attention, I will be slipping over the wall. While you will be there to distract them, in part, you will play an even more vital role that they will never expect. The game was afoot. Nicholas was in rapture as he listened, as he watched. He so liked the game, especially when he knew all the rules and could bend them to his wishes. It was going to be a glorious day tomorrow. But Lord Rull, the big man, Tom, asked, how are we going to be able to attack through the gate if it's as formidable as you say? Nicholas hadn't thought of that. 
How curious. A key part of Lord Rawl's plan seemed to be faulty. That's the real trick, Lord Rawl said. I've already figured it out, and you'll be amazed to hear how you're going to do it. He had already figured it out? How curious. Nicholas wanted to hear what possible solution could solve such a major hitch in Lord Rawl's plan. Lord Rawl stretched and yawned. Look, he said, I'm exhausted. I can't stand up anymore. I need to get some rest before I lay it all out for you. It's complicated, so I'd better wait until just before we leave. Wake me up two hours before dawn, and I'll explain the whole thing then. Two hours before dawn, Tom repeated in confirmation of the orders. Nicholas was furious. He wanted to hear it now. He wanted to know the wonderful, fabulous, complicated plan. Lord Rawl gestured to his delicious companion, the one named Kara, and then to several of the young men. Why don't you come with me and get some sleep while the rest finish their meal? As they started away, Lord Rawl turned back. Jensen, I want you to keep Betty here with you. Make sure she stays here. I need some sleep. I don't need the smell of goat to wake me up. Am I going with you in the morning, Richard? The one called Jensen asked. Yes, you play an important part in the plan. Lord Rawl yawned again. I'll explain after I've slept. Don't forget, Tom. Two hours before dawn. Tom nodded. I will wake you myself, Lord Rawl. Nicholas would be there as well to watch, to hear the final piece of Lord Rawl's plan. Nicholas could hardly stand to wait that long. He would be there early. He would hear every word of it. And then Nicholas would have a surprise waiting for Richard Rawl when he and his men came for a visit. Maybe neither the poison nor his gift would take Lord Rawl. Maybe Nicholas would do it himself. Her spirit a helpless prisoner to the slide, Kaylin could do nothing but watch along with him. She was unable to answer Richard's forlorn pleas, unable to cry in sorrow for him, unable to do anything. She ached to be able to hold him in her arms again to comfort his pain, his heartache. He was near the end. She knew that. It broke her heart to see his precious life slipping away, to see his tears, to hear him cry her name in longing, to hear him say how much he needed her. She felt so cold and alone. She loathed the feeling of being adrift. She desperately wanted to be back in her body. It waited somewhere back in a lonely room in the fortified encampment. Nicholas's body waited there too. If only she could get back there. Most of all, she wished there were some way she could warn Richard that Nicholas knew his plan. Chapter 63 Nicholas lay in wait in the camp, sniffing, listening, watching, eager for the game to continue. He had come early, fearing to miss anything. He was sure it had to be two hours before dawn, time for the last act of the play. It was time for the man, Tom, to wake Lord Rawl. It was time. Watch, watch, watch. Where was he? Somewhere, somewhere. Look, look, look. Men off through the trees stood guard over the camp. Where was Tom? There he was. Nicholas saw that Tom was one of the men standing vigil as others slept. Didn't want to be late. Lord Rawl's orders. He wasn't sleeping, he was awake, so he should know it was time. What was the man waiting for? His master had given him a command. Why wasn't he doing as he had been told? The woman, Jensen, woke and rubbed her eyes. She looked up and took appraisal of the stars and moon. It was time. She knew it was. She threw off her blanket. Nicholas followed behind as she rushed past the low glow of the smoldering embers rushed back through the stand of young trees, rushed to the big man leaning against a stump. Tom, isn't it time to wake Richard? Somewhere back in the distant room in the fortification, where his body waited, Nicholas heard an insistent noise. He was absorbed in the task at hand, in the game, so he ignored the sound. Probably Najari. The man was eager to have a chance to get at the mother confessor, a chance to enjoy her more feminine charms. 
Nicholas had told Najari that he would have his chance, but he had to wait until Nicholas returned. Nicholas didn't want the man tampering with her body while they were gone. Najari sometimes didn't know his own strength. The mother confessor was valuable property, and Nicholas didn't want that property damaged. Najari had proven to be a loyal man and deserved a small reward, but not until later. He would not disobey Nicholas's orders. He would be sorry if he did. Maybe it was just... Wait, wait, what was this? Watch, watch, watch. The man stood and put a hand reassuringly on the young woman's shoulder. How very touching. Yes, I guess it is about time. Let's go wake Lord Rull. Again the noise, stealthy, sharp, yet soft. Most odd, but it would have to wait. Through the woods, hurry, watch, 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 hurry. Couldn't they move faster? Didn't they grasp the importance of the occasion? Hurry, hurry, hurry. Betty, the Jensen woman growled, stop bumping my legs. Again, there was a skulking sound back somewhere with his body, and then another more urgent sound. This time, the sound ran a sharp shiver through Nicholas's very soul. It was as deadly a sound as he had ever heard. As the Sword of Truth cleared its scabbard, the distinctive ring of steel filled the dimly lit room. With the sword came ancient magic, unhindered, unrestrained, unleashed. The sword's power instantly inundated Richard with its boundless fury, a fury that answered only to him. The force of that power flooded into every fiber of his being. It had been so long since he had truly felt it truly felt the full magnitude of it that for an instant Richard paused in the exaltation of the profound experience of simply holding such a singular weapon. His own righteous wrath had already slipped its bounds. Joined now with the pure rage of the sword of truth, both spiraled through him like twin storms rampaging unchecked. Richard gloried that they could, and at being the ultimate master of both. The seeker of truth willed both storms ever onward, even as the sword began its fearsome journey, the merciless lightning of those thunderheads about to strike. The tip of the blade whistled through the night air, still two hours before dawn. Hesitant and uncertain, Nicholas watched as the man, Tom, and the Jensen woman moved through the woods to awaken their dying Lord Rahl. Somewhere back in a distant room in the fortification where his body waited, Nicholas heard a scream. It was not a scream of fear, but a riotous cry of unbridled rage. It sent a shiver through his soul. With sudden alarm, knowing that it could not be ignored, Nicholas slammed back into his body where it sat on the floor waiting for him. Unsteady from the abrupt return, Nicholas blinked as he opened his eyes. Lord Rahl himself stood before him, feet spread, both hands gripping his sword. It was a picture of sheer muscular force focused by terrifying resolve. Nicholas's eyes went wide at seeing the gleaming blade arcing through the still air. Lord Rahl was in the midst of a scream of startling power and rage. Every bit of his might was committed to the swing of his sword. Nicholas had a sudden and completely unexpected realization. He didn't want to die. He very much wanted to live. As much as he hated life, he realized now that he wanted to hold on to it. He had to act. He summoned his power, rallied his will. He had to stop this avenging soul before him. He reached out with his power to seize this other's spirit. He felt the horrifying shock of a staggering blow against the side of his neck. Richard was still screaming as his sword, with every ounce of power and speed he could put behind it, swept around, just clearing the top of Nicholas's left shoulder. Richard saw every detail as the blade tore through flesh and bone, turning muscle, tendon, arteries, and windpipe inside out, following with precision the path to which the seeker had justly committed it. Richard had dedicated everything to the swift journey of his sword. 
Now he watched as that journey reached its destination, as the blade cleared the neck of Nicholas the Slide, as the man's head, its mouth still opened in the beginning of shock not fully comprehended, his beady eyes still trying to grasp the totality of what they were seeing, lifted into the air, beginning to turn ever so slowly as the sword below it passed along its deadly arc, as curved ropes of the man's blood began tracing a long wet line across the wall behind him. Richard's scream ended as the sword's swing reached its limit. The world came crashing back around him. The head hit the floor with a loud, bone-cracking thunk. It was ended. Richard recalled the rage. He had to get it under control immediately. He had something yet more important to accomplish. In one fluid motion, Richard slid the bloody blade home into its scabbard as he turned to the second body leaned up against the wall to the right. The sight of her almost overcame him. To see her there, alive, breathing, seemingly unhurt, brought a wild rush of joy. His worst fears, fears he would not even allow into his conscious mind, evaporated in an instant. But then he realized that she was not all right. She could not have slept through such an attack. Richard fell to his knees and took her up in his arms. She felt so light, so limp. Her face was ashen and beaded with sweat. Her eyelids were half-closed, her eyes rolled back in her head. Richard sank back within himself, seeking strength to bring back the one he loved more than life itself. He opened his soul to her. All he wanted, all he needed, as he held her to him, was for her to live, to be whole. Instinctively, in a way he did not fully understand, he let his power well up from a place deep inside his mind. He released himself into the torrent as it rushed onward. He let his love of her, his need of her, flood through their connection as he hugged her to his breast. Come home to where you belong, he whispered to her. He let the core of his power course through her, intending it to be like a beacon to light her way. It felt as if he were searching through the dark, using the light of ability from deep within to help him. Even though he couldn't define the precise mechanism, he could consciously focus his purpose, his need, and what he wanted to accomplish. Come home to me, Kalen. I'm here. Kalen gasped. Even though she hung limp, he felt the intensity of the life in his arms. She gasped again, as if she had nearly drowned and needed air. At last, she stirred in his arms, her limbs moving, groping. She opened her eyes, blinking and looked up. Astonished, she sank back into his arms. Richard, I heard you. I was so alone. Dear spirits, I was so alone. I didn't know what to do. I heard Nicholas scream. I was lost and alone. I didn't know how to get back. And then I felt you. She embraced him tightly, as if she never wanted to let go. You led me back through the darkness. Richard smiled down at her. I'm a guide, remember? She puzzled at him. How could you do that? Her beautiful green eyes opened expectantly. Richard, your gift. I figured out the problem with my gift. Kajarang had given me the solution. I'd had the solution long before that, but I never realized it. My gift is fine now, and the sword's power works again. I was being so blind that I will be ashamed to tell it all to you. Richard's breath caught and he coughed then, unable to hold it back any longer, nor could he hold back grimacing at the pain. Kalin gripped his arms. The antidote? What happened to the antidote? I sent it back with Owen. Didn't you get it? Richard shook his head as he coughed again, the pain feeling as though it ripped him deep inside. He finally regained his breath. Well, now, that is a problem. It wasn't the antidote. It was just water with a bit of cinnamon in it. Kalin's face went ashen. But she looked over at Nicholas's body, at his head lying upended at the end of a bloody trail across the floor. Richard, if Nicholas is dead, how are we going to get the antidote? There isn't any antidote. Nicholas wanted me dead. He would have destroyed the antidote long ago. He gave you a fake to be able to capture you. Her face had gone from joy to horror. But 
without the antidote. Page 638. Chapter 64. There's no time to worry about the poison just now, Richard told her as he helped her to her feet. No time? She watched his step falter as he made his way across the room. He groped for the window ledge. At the small window opening in the outer wall of the fortification, he signaled with the high, clear whistle of the common wood peewee. The whistle Kara thought was that of the mythical short-tailed pine hawk. I used a ladder pole, he explained. Kara is on her way. Kalin tried to make her way over to him, but her body felt alarmingly unfamiliar to her. She staggered a couple of steps, her legs moving woodenly. She had the urge to get down on her hands and feet to walk. She felt like a stranger inside her own skin. It seemed foreign to have to breathe on her own, to have to look through her own eyes, to have to listen through her own ears. It was a strange, haunting sensation to feel her clothes against her skin. Richard held out his hand to help steady her. Kaylin thought that as wobbly as she was, she might still be more steady on her feet than Richard. We're going to have to fight our way out, he said, but we'll have some help. I'll get you the first sword I can. Richard blew out the flame of the single candle before a tin reflector on a small shelf. Richard, I'm not yet used to being back inside myself. I don't think I'm ready to go out there. I can hardly walk. We don't have a lot of choice. We have to get out. Learn as you go. I'll help you. You can hardly walk yourself. Kara, at the top of a pole ladder Richard had cut, leaned forward and wriggled in through the small window. Halfway in, Kara gaped in delighted wonder. Mother Confessor, Lord Rall did it. You don't need to sound so surprised, Richard griped as he helped the Mord Sith the rest of the way in. Kara only briefly took note of the dead man sprawled across the floor before Kaelin threw her arms around the woman. You can't imagine how glad I am to see you, Kara said. Well, you can't imagine how glad I am to see you through my own eyes. If only the trade you made had worked, Kara added in a whisper. We'll find another way, Kaelin assured her. Richard slowly drew the door open a crack and peeked out. He shut the door and turned back. It's clear. Doors to the left and around the balcony are the rooms with the women in them. Stairs to the right are the closest that lead down. Some of the rooms at the bottom are for officers. Others are barracks for soldiers. Kara nodded. I'm ready. Kalin looked from one to the other. Ready for what? Richard took her by the elbow. I need you to help me see. Help you see? Is it progressing that fast? Just listen. We're going to move along the balcony to the left and open the doors. Do your best to keep the women calm. We're going to break them out of here. Kaylin was a bit confused by everything. It was completely different from the plans she had been hearing along with Nicholas. She knew she would just have to follow Richard and Kara's lead. Outside on the simple wooden balcony, there were no lamps or torches. The moon was down behind the black sprawl of the mountains. Kalin's sight when Nicholas had controlled her had been like looking through a greasy pane of wavy glass. The sparkling vault of stars overhead had never looked so beautiful. In that starlight, Kalin could see simple buildings lined up around the outer wall of the fortification. Richard and Kara moved along the balcony, opening doors. At each one, Kara quickly ducked inside. Some of the women came out in their nightshirts. Some, Kalin could hear inside, rushing to get dressed. In some of the rooms, babies cried. While Kara was in one of the rooms, Richard opened another door. He leaned close to Kalin and whispered, Go in and tell the women inside that we've come to help them escape. Tell them that their men have come to get them out, but they must be as quiet as possible or we'll be caught. Kalin rushed in as best she could on unsteady legs and woke the young woman in the bed to the right. She sat up terrified but silent. Kalin reached around and shook the woman in the other bed. We've come to help you escape. You mustn't make any noise. Your men are going to help. You have a chance to be free. Free? The first woman asked. Yes, it's up to you, but I strongly advise you to take the chance and to hurry. The women flew out of their beds and grabbed for clothes. Richard, Kalin, and Kara moved farther down the balcony, asking the women who had already come out to help rouse the others. 
In a matter of a few minutes, hundreds of women were huddled together out on the balcony. There was no problem keeping them quiet. They were all too familiar with the consequences of causing trouble. They didn't want to do anything to get themselves caught trying to escape. Before long, they had made it all the way around the fortification balcony. Most of the women had very young babies, ones too young to be taken away. The babies were mostly sound asleep in their mother's arms, but some of them started to cry. The mothers desperately tried to rock and cuddle them into silence. Kalin hoped that it was a common enough sound that it wouldn't draw the attention of the soldiers. Wait here, Richard whispered to Kalin. Keep everyone up here until we get the gate open. With Kara right behind him, Richard slipped carefully down the steps and started across the open yard. When one of the babies suddenly began bawling, soldiers came out of a building to see what was going on. They spotted Richard and Kalin. The soldiers yelled, sounding an alarm. Kalin heard the distinctive ring of steel as Richard drew his sword. Men rushed out of some of the doors, heading Richard and Kara off. Being used to dealing with these people, the men rushing toward Richard apparently weren't greatly concerned about violence. They were wrong and fell as soon as they got close enough for Richard to strike. Some Richard took down as he ran, others Kara caught as they tried to come in from the side. The screams of some of the men as they fell woke the whole encampment. Men rushed out of barracks below, pulling on their trousers and shirts, dragging weapon belts behind. In the faint starlight, Kalin spotted Richard by the drop gate. He took a mighty swing. Sparks showered across the wall as the sword shattered one of the heavy chains holding up the gate. Richard ran to the other side to cut the other chain. Two men caught up to him there. In one fluid movement, Richard cut them both down. As Kara dropped other men who were rushing in at Richard, he swung the sword again. White hot fragments of steel filled the air along with the ringing sound of metal shattering. The gate groaned and slowly started to fall outward. Richard heaved his weight against it and it picked up speed. With a resounding crash, it came down, raising clouds of dust. A great cry rose up as men outside, wielding swords, axes, and battle maces, charged in across the broken bridge and into the fortification. The soldiers rushed to meet the invasion, and there was a great clash of weapons and men. Kalin saw then that soldiers were racing up the stairway on the opposite side of the balcony. Come on, Kalin yelled to the women. We have to get out now. Holding the rail to keep her balance, Kalin raced down the steps, all the women pouring down behind her, a number of carrying screaming babies. Richard ran to meet her at the bottom. He tossed her a short sword with a leather-wound grip, Kalin caught it by the handle just in time to turn and slash a soldier running up from beneath the balcony. Owen made his way through the fighting and over to the women. Come on, he called to them. Get to the gate, run. The women, galvanized by his command, started running across the compound. As they reached the fighting, some of the women, instead of running out the gate, took the opportunity to leap on the backs of soldiers fighting Owen and his men. The women bit the men on the backs, beat at their heads, tore at their eyes. The soldiers were not restrained in dealing with the women, and several were brutally killed. It didn't stop others from joining the fight. If they would only run for the gate, they could escape, but instead they were attacking the soldiers with their bare hands. They had been held in bondage to these men for a very long time. Kalin could only imagine what they had gone through and couldn't say she blamed them. She was still having difficulty moving, making her body do what she wanted it to do, or she would have joined them. Kalin turned at a sound only to see a man charging in at her. She recognized his flattened nose, Najari, Nicholas's right-hand man. He was one of the men who had carried her to the fortification. He wore a wicked grin as he came for her. She could have used her power on him, but she feared to trust it right then so instead brought the short sword out from behind her back and slammed it through Najari's gut. He stood stiffly right in front of her, his eyes wide. She could smell the stink of his breath. Kalin wrenched the handle of the sword to the side. Mouth opened wide. He panted, fearing to draw a deep breath, fearing to move and cause any more damage. Kalin gritted her teeth and swept the sword's handle around in an arc, ripping his insides apart. 
She stared into his startled eyes as he slid off her sword. He grunted in pain as he dropped to his knees, holding his wound together as best he could. He never got what Kalin knew he intended, what Nicholas had promised him. He fell forward onto his face, spilling his insides across the ground at her feet. Kalin turned to the attack. Richard was engaged in slashing his way through men trying to surround him as he fought to keep the gate clear. Others, Richard's men, came at the enemy from behind, cutting into them the way Richard had taught them. Kalin saw Owen not far away. He was standing in the open among the fallen and the fighting, staring across the raging battle to a man just outside one of the doors under the balcony. The man had a thick black beard, a shaved head, and a ring through one ear and one nostril. His arms were as big as tree limbs. His shoulders were twice as wide as Owen's. Luchan, Owen said to himself. Owen started across the open area of the fortification, past men engaged in pitched battle, past those crying out and those falling to blades, past swords and axes sweeping through the air as if he didn't even see them. His eyes were locked on the man watching him come. The face of a young woman appeared in the dark doorway behind Luchan. He turned and growled at her to go back inside, that he was going to take care of the little man from her village. When Luchan turned back around, Owen was standing before him. Luchan laughed and put his fists on his hips. Why don't you scurry back into your hole? Owen said nothing, gave no warning, made no demands. He simply lit into Luchan with a vengeance just as Richard had counseled him to do, slamming a knife into the big man's chest over and over before Luchan had a chance to react. He had underestimated Owen. It had cost him his life. The woman rushed out of the doorway and came to a halt over the body of her former master. She stared down at him, at his one arm splayed out to the side, at the other lying across his bloody chest, at the unseeing eyes. She looked up at Owen. Kalin assumed that this was Mara Lee and feared that she was going to reject Owen for harming another, that she would castigate him for what he had done. Instead, she rushed to Owen and threw her arms around him. The woman went to her knees beside the body and took the bloody knife from Owen's hand. She turned to the fallen Luchan and stabbed him half a dozen times with such force that it drove the knife in up to the hilt with every thrust. Watching her tearful fury, Kaylin didn't have to wonder how she had been treated by the man. Her anger spent, she stood again and tearfully hugged Owen. Kaylin needed to get to Richard. She was relieved that her ability to move as she intended was returning. She started making her way around the edge of the battle, staying close to the walls, past men who saw her and thought she would be an easy mark. They didn't know that from a young age she had been taught to use a sword by her father, King Wyborn, and that Richard had later honed her skill to deadly proficiency, teaching her how to use her lighter weight to give her lethal speed. It was the last mistake the men made. Off across the open area, a mob of soldiers, now fully awake and fully prepared to engage in battle, swarmed out of the barracks. They all charged for Richard. Kalin knew right away that there were too many. Richard's men couldn't stop the flood of soldiers as they streamed across the encampment. All of them crashed in toward Richard. Kalin heard a deafening crack like lightning as the walls of the fortification lit with a flash. She had to turn away and shield her eyes. Night turned to day, and at the same time, a darkness darker than any night was loosed. A blazing white-hot bolt of additive magic twisted and coiled around and through a crackling black void of subtractive magic, creating a violent rope of twin lightning joined to a terrible purpose. It seemed as if the noonday sun crashed down among them. The air itself was drawn into the fierce heat and light. Try as she might, Kalin couldn't draw a breath against the force of it. Richard's fury gathered it all into a single point. In an explosive instant, the thunderous ignition of light unleashed a devastating blast of staggering destruction radiating outward across the entire encampment, annihilating the Imperial Order soldiers. The night fell dark and silent. 
men and women stood stunned among the sea of blood and viscera, gazing around at the unrecognizable remains of the enemy soldiers. The battle was over. The people of Bandakar had carried the day. At last the women fell to wailing and crying, ecstatic to be free. They knew many of the men who had come to free them and clung to them in gratitude, overwhelmed with joy to be reunited. They hugged friends, relatives, and strangers alike. The men, too, wept with relief and happiness. Kalin rushed through the maze of rejoicing people crowded into the open area of the fortification. Men cheered her, thrilled that she, too, had been liberated. Many of the men wanted to talk to her, but she kept running to get to Richard. He stood to the side, leaning against the wall, Kara helping to hold him up. He still gripped his blood-slicked sword in his fist, the blade's tip resting on the ground. Owen, too, made his way over to Richard. Mother Confessor, I'm so relieved and thankful to have you back. He looked over at a smiling Richard. Lord Rall, I would like you to meet Marilee. This woman, who only a short time ago had savagely stabbed the corpse of her captor, now seemed too shy to speak. She dipped her head in greeting. Richard straightened and smiled that smile Kalin so loved to see, a smile filled with the sheer pleasure of life. I'm very happy to meet you, Marilee. Owen has told us all about you and about how much you mean to him. Through all that happened, you were always first in his mind and heart. His love for you moved him to act to change his entire empire for the better. She seemed to be overwhelmed by it all and by his words. Lord Rall came to us and did something more important than saving us all, Owen told Marilee. Lord Rall gave me the courage to come and fight for you, to fight to save you, for all of us to fight for our own lives and the lives of those we love. Beaming, Marilee leaned in and kissed Richard on the cheek. Thank you, Lord Rall. I never knew my Owen could do such things. Believe me, Kara said, we had our doubts about him too. She clapped Owen on the back of the shoulder. But he did well. I, too, have come to understand the value of what he has done, Merrily said to Richard, of the things you seem to have taught our people. Richard smiled at the two of them, but then he could no longer hold back the coughing that so hurt him. The mood of joyous liberation suddenly changed. People rushed in around them, helping to hold him up. Kalin saw blood running down his chin. Richard! she cried. No! They eased him to the ground. He clutched at Kaylin's sleeve, wanting to have her close. Kaylin saw tears running down Kara's cheek. It seemed that he had spent all the strength he had left. He was slipping into the fatal grasp of the poison, and there was nothing they could do for him. Owen, Richard said, panting to catch his breath when the spell of coughing stopped. How far? to your town. His voice was getting hoarse. Not far, only hours, if we hurry. The man who made the poison and the antidote, he lived there? Yes, his place is still there. Take me there. Owen looked puzzled, but he nodded eagerly. Of course. Hurry, Richard added, trying to get up. He couldn't. Tom appeared in the crowd. Jensen was there, too. Get some poles. Tom commanded, and some canvas or blankets. We'll make a litter. Four men at a time can carry him. We can run and get him there quickly. Men rushed to the buildings, searching for what they would need to make a litter. Chapter 65 Kalin hurriedly pulled the tin off the shelf and opened the lid. The tin contained a yellowish powder. It was the right color. She leaned down and showed it to Richard as he lay in the litter. He reached in and took a pinch. He smelled it, he put his tongue to it, and then nodded. Just a little, he whispered, lifting it out to her. Kaylin held out her palm while he dribbled some of the crushed powder in her hand. He threw the rest on the floor, too weak to bother returning it to the tin. Kaylin added the small portion on her palm to one of the pots of boiling water. Cloth bags of herbs steeped in other pots of hot water. Alkaloids from dried mushrooms were soaking in oil. 
Richard had other people grating stalks of plants. Lobella, Richard said. His eyes were closed. Owen bent down. Lobella? Richard nodded. It will be a dried herb. Owen turned to the shelves and started looking. There were hundreds of little square cubby holes in the wall of the place where the man who had made Richard's poison and the antidote used to work. It was a small, simple, single-room building with little light. It was not nearly as well equipped as the herbalist places Kalin had seen before, but the man had an extensive collection of things. More than that, he had once made the antidote, presumably from what was there. Here, Owen said, holding a bag down for Richard to see. It says Lobella on the tag. Grind a little pile half the size of your thumbnail. Sift out the fibers and discard them. Then add what's left to the bowl with the darker oil. Richard knew about herbs, but he didn't know anywhere near enough about herbs to concoct the cure for the poison he had been given. His gift seemed to be guiding him. Richard was in a near trance, or nearly unconscious. Kalin wasn't exactly sure which. He was having difficulty breathing. She didn't know what else to do to help him. If they didn't do something, he was going to die, and soon. As long as he lay quietly on the litter, he was resting more comfortably, but that was not going to make him recover. It had been a short run to Witherton, but it had taken too long as far as Kalin was concerned. Yarrow, Richard said. Kalin leaned down. What preparation? Oil, Richard said. Kalin fumbled through the shelves of small bottles. She found one labeled Yarrow Oil. She squatted down and held it before Richard. How much? She lifted one of his hands and put the bottle in it, closing his fingers around it so he could tell its size. How much? Is it full? Kalin hurriedly wiggled out the whittled wooden stopper. Yes. Half, Richard said. In with any of the other oils. I found the fever few, Jensen said as she hopped down from the stool. Make a tincture, Richard told her. Kalin replaced the stopper in the bottle and squatted down beside Richard. What next? Make an infusion of mullen. Mullen, mullen. Kalin mumbled as she turned to the task. As Richard gave them instructions, half a dozen people worked at boiling, blending, crushing, grating, filtering, and steeping. They added some of the preparations together as they were completed and kept others separate as they worked on them. As they worked, the number of various tasks were combined and reduced at specified points. Richard gestured for Owen. Owen brushed his hands clean on his trouser legs as he bent down to await instruction. Cold, Richard said, his eyes closed. We need something cold. We need a way to cool it. Owen thought a moment. There's a stream not far. Richard pointed to various stations where people labored. Pour those bowls of preparations and powders into the boiling water in the kettle there. Then take it to the stream. Hold the kettle down in the water to cool it. Richard held up a finger in caution. Don't put it in too deep and let the water from the stream run in over the top or it will be ruined. Owen shook his head. I won't. He stood impatiently as Kalin poured the contents of shallow bowls into the boiling pot of water. She didn't know if any of this made sense, but she knew that Richard had the gift, and he certainly had figured out and eliminated the problem he had been having with it. If his gift could guide him in making the antidote, it might save his life. Kalin didn't know anything else that would. She handed the kettle to Owen. He ran out the door to put it in the stream to cool it. Kara followed him out to make sure that nothing happened to what might be the only thing that could save Richard's life. Jensen sat on the floor on the other side of him, holding his hand. With the back of her wrist, Kalin pushed her hair off her face. She sat beside Richard and took his free hand to wait for Owen and Kara to return. Betty stood in the doorway, her ears pricked forward, her tail intermittently going into a hopeful blur of wagging whenever Jensen or Kalin looked her way. It seemed like hours until Owen came running back with the kettle, although Kalin knew it really hadn't been all that long. Filter it through a cloth, Richard said. But don't squeeze the cloth at the end. 
Just let the liquid run through until you have half a cup of it. Once you've done that, then add the oils to the liquid you collected in the cup. Everyone stood watching Kaylin work, snatching up what she needed, tossing it away when she was finished with it. When she had enough liquid from the kettle collected in the cup, she poured in the oils. Stir it with a stick of cinnamon, Richard said. Owen climbed up on the stool. I remember seeing cinnamon. He handed a stick down to Kaylin. She stirred the golden liquid, but it didn't seem to be working. The oil and water don't want to mix, she told Richard. His head was rolled to the side away from her. Keep mixing. A moment will come when they suddenly come together. Dubious, Kaylin kept stirring. She could see that the oils were sticking together in globs and not mixing with the water she had filtered through the cloth. The more it cooled, the less and less it looked like it was going to work. Kaylin felt a tear of desperation run down her cheek and drip off her jaw. The contents of the cup stiffened. She kept stirring, not wanting to tell Richard that it wasn't working. She swallowed past the growing lump in her throat. The contents in the cup began to melt. Kaylin gasped. She blinked. Everything in the cup suddenly went together in a smooth, syrupy liquid. Richard, she wiped the tear from her cheek. It worked. It mixed together. Now what? He held his hand out. It's ready. Give it to me. Jensen and Kara helped him to sit up. Kaylin held the precious cup in both hands and carefully put it to his mouth. She tipped it up to help him drink. It took a while to get it down. He had to stop from time to time as he sipped, trying not to cough. It was a lot more than had been in any of the little square-sided bottles, but Kalin figured that maybe he needed more, since he was so late to be taking it. When he was finished, she reached up and set the cup on the counter. She licked a drop of the liquid off her finger. The antidote had the slight aroma of cinnamon and a sweet, spicy taste. She hoped that was right. Richard worked at recovering his breath after the effort of drinking. They gently laid him back down. His hands were trembling. He looked miserable. Just let me rest now, he murmured. Betty, still standing in the doorway watching intently, bleated her wish to come in. He will be all right, Jensen said to her friend. You just stay out there and let him rest. Betty puled softly and then lay down in the doorway to wait along with the rest of them. It was going to be a long night. Kaylin didn't think she was going to be able to sleep until she knew if Richard would be all right. Zed pointed. There's another one there that needs to be cleaned up, he said to Chase. Chase wore a chain mail shirt over a tan leather tunic. His heavy black trousers held a black belt set with a large silver buckle emblazoned with the emblem of the Boundary Wardens. Beneath his black cloak, strapped everywhere, legs, waist, upper arms, over the backs of his shoulders, was a small arsenal of weapons. Everything from small, thin spikes held in the fist and used to puncture the skull, to a crescent-shaped battle axe used to divide a skull cleanly with one blow. Chase was deadly with any of them. It had been a while now since they needed the skills of a Boundary Warden. Chase seemed to be a man without a mission. The big man walked across the rampart and bent to pull a knife from beneath the body. He grunted in recognition. There it is. He held the walnut-handled knife up to the light as he inspected it. I was worried I'd lost it. He slipped the knife into an empty sheath without having to look. With one hand, he grabbed the waistband of the trousers and picked up the stiff body. He stepped into an opening in the crenellated wall and heaved the body out into the air. Zed looked over the edge. It was a drop of several thousand feet before the rock of the mountain flared enough for anything falling to make contact. It was several thousand more feet down a granite cliff before the forest began. The golden sun was getting low in the mountains. The clouds had taken on streaks of gold and orange. From this distance, the city below was as beautiful as ever, except Zed knew that it was an empty place without the people to bring it life. Chase, Zed, Rachel called from the doorway. The stew is ready. Zed threw his skinny arms into the air. 
Bags, it's about time. A man could starve waiting for stew to cook. Rachel planted her fist with the wooden spoon on her hip and shook a finger of her other hand at him. If you keep saying bad words, you'll not get any dinner. Chase let out a sigh as he glanced over at Zed. And you think you have troubles. You wouldn't think that a girl who doesn't come up to my belt buckle could be such a trial. Zed followed Chase to the doorway through the thick stone wall. Is she always this much trouble? Chase mussed Rachel's hair on the way past. Always, he confided. Is the stew good? Zed asked. Worth watching my language for? My new mother taught me how to make it, Rachel said in a tempting sing-song. Rika had some before she went out, and she said it was good. Zed smoothed back his unruly white hair. Well, Emma can cook better than any woman I ever met. Then be good, Rachel said, and I'll give you biscuits to go with the stew. Biscuits? Sure, stew wouldn't be stew without biscuits. Zed blinked at the child. Why, that's what I always thought, too. You'd better let me see if she made it right first, Chase said, as they passed through the tapestry-lined halls of the keep. I'd hate you to go making any firm commitments before we even know if the stew is edible. Friedrich helped me with the heavy parts, Rachel said. He says it's good. We'll see, Chase said. Rachel turned and shook her wooden spoon at him. You have to wash your hands first, though. I saw you throwing that dead man over the wall. You have to wash your hands before you come to the table and eat. Chase gave Zed a look of strained forbearance. Somewhere there's a boy enjoying himself right now, probably carrying around a dead frog, oblivious to the sorry fact that he's someday going to be married to Little Miss Wash Your Hands Before You Eat. Zed smiled. When Chase had taken Rachel in to be his daughter, it was just about the best thing Zed could ever have wished for. Rachel thought so too, and it looked like she still did. She was fiercely devoted to the man. As they sat at the table before the cheery fire in the hearth, Zed enjoying his third bowl of stew, he couldn't recall the keep being such a wonderful place. It was because there was a child along with friends once again in the halls of the keep. Friedrich, the man who had come on Richard's orders to warn Zed of the impending attack on the keep, had realized he had not been in time. The man used his head and had sought out Chase, the old friend he had heard Richard talk about. While Chase had gone to rescue Zed and Addie, Friedrich had returned to the keep to spy on the people who had taken it. By watching carefully and staying out of sight of a sister, Friedrich had been able to provide Chase and Zed invaluable information about the number of people occupying the keep and their routines. He then helped take the place back. Zed liked the man. He was not only frightfully handy with a knife, but entertaining at conversation. Friedrich, since he had been married to a sorceress, was able to converse with Zed without being intimidated, as some were of wizards. Having lived in Dahara all his life, Friedrich was also able to fill in pieces of information. Rachel held up a carving of a hawk. Look what Friedrich made for me, Zed. Isn't it the most beautiful thing you ever did see? Zed smiled. It certainly is. It's nothing, Friedrich scoffed. If I had some gold leaf, then I could gild it for you. That used to be what I did for a living. He leaned back and smiled to himself, until Lord Rall made me a boundary warden. You know, Zed drawled offhandedly to both men, the keep is even more vulnerable now to those who might come and don't have magic than to those who do. I'm just fine protecting against those who are affected by magic, but not the other kind. Chase nodded. Seems so. Well, the thing is, he went on, I was thinking that since there's no boundary any longer, and what with all the trouble about, perhaps you too would like to take on the responsibility of helping to protect the wizard's keep. I'm not nearly so fit for the task as would be someone trained in such things. Zed leaned in, his brow lowering. It's vitally important. Elbows on the table, Chase chewed a bite of biscuit as he watched Zed. Finally, he stirred his spoon around in his bowl. Well, it could be a disaster if Jagang were to use those ungifted men to get his hands on the place again. 
He thought about it. Emma will understand, Zed shrugged. Bring her here, Chase frowned. Bring her here, Zed gestured around. The keep is certainly big enough. But what would we do with our children, Chase leaned back. You don't want all my children here in the keep, Zed. They'd be running up and down, playing in the halls. It would drive you batty. Besides, Chase added, peering with one scowling eye at Rachel, each one's uglier than the next. Rachel hid her giggle behind a biscuit. Zed remembered the sounds of children's laughter in the keep, the sounds of joy and love. Well, it would be a burden, he agreed. But this is, after all, about the protection of the keep. What sacrifice wouldn't it be worth making to protect the keep? Rachel looked from Chase to Zed. My new sister, Lee, could bring Cat back to you, Zed. That's right, Zed said, throwing his hands up. I haven't seen Cat for ages. Is Lee treating Cat well? Rachel nodded earnestly. Oh, yes, we all take good care of Cat. What do you think, Rachel? Chase finally asked. Would you want to live here in this dusty old place with Zed? Rachel ran over and hugged Chase's leg. Oh, yes, can we please? It would be ever so grand. Chase sighed. Then I guess it's settled. But you'll have to behave and not bother Zed by being too loud. I promise, Rachel said. She frowned up at Zed. Will Mother have to crawl into the keep through that little tunnel like we did? Zed chuckled. No, no, we'll let her come in the proper way like the lady she is. He turned to Friedrich. How about it, Boundary Warden? Would you be willing to continue doing Lord Rao's bidding and stay to help guard the keep? Friedrich slowly spun the bird carving by the tip of one wing, thinking. You know, Zed added, while you're waiting for some fearsome attack, there are any number of old gilded things here at the keep that are in terrible need of repair. Perhaps you would consider taking on the job of being the keep's official gilder? We have plenty of gold leaf. And someday, when the people return to Aidendrill, you would have a steady supply of customers. Friedrich stared down at the table. I don't know. This one adventure was all well and good, but since my wife Althea died, I don't seem to be interested in much. Zed nodded. I know how it is. I used to have a wife. I think it would do you good to get paid to do something needed. Friedrich smiled. All right, then. I will take your job, wizard. Good, Chase said. I'll have someone to help me when I need to lock troublesome children in the dungeon. Rachel giggled as he set her on the ground. Chase pushed his chair back and stood. Well, Friedrich, if we're going to be keep wardens, then I think we ought to make some rounds and satisfy ourselves about the security of a few things. As big as this place is, Rika could use the help. Just mind the shields, Zed reminded them as they headed for the door. After the two men had gone off, Rachel got Zed another biscuit to go with the rest of his stew. Her little brow bunched together earnestly. When we live here, we'll try to be real quiet for you, Zed. Well, you know, Rachel, the keep is a big place. I doubt you would bother me much if you and your brothers and sisters wanted to play a little bit. Really? Zed pulled the leather-covered ball painted with faded blue and pink zigzagged lines all around it out of his pocket and set it on the table. Rachel's eyes lit up in astonishment. I found this old ball, he said, gesturing with his biscuit. I think a ball has a much better time if it has someone to play with it. Do you think you and your brothers and sisters might like to play with this when you live here? You can bounce it down the halls to your heart's content. Her mouth fell open. Really, Zed? Zed grinned at the look on her face. Really? Maybe I can bounce it in the dark hall that makes the funny noises. Then it wouldn't bother you any more than now. This old place is full of funny noises, and a bouncing ball isn't liable to cause too much trouble. She climbed up in his lap and put her little arms around his neck, hugging him tightly. It's a lot better hugging you now that you found those things to get that awful collar off your neck. Zed rubbed her back as she hugged him. Yes, it is, little one. Yes, it is. She leaned back and looked at him. 
I wish Richard and Kaylin could be here to play with the ball, too. I miss them something fierce. Zed smiled. Me too, little one, me too. She frowned at him. Don't get tears, Zed. I won't make a lot of noise to bother you. Zed shook a bony finger at her. I'm afraid you have a lot to learn about playing with a ball. I do? Of course. Laughing goes with playing with a ball, like biscuits go with stew. She frowned at him, not sure if he was telling the truth. He set her on the floor. Tell you what, why don't you come with me and I'll show you. Really, Zed? Zed stood up and mussed her hair. Really? He scooped the ball off the table. Let's see if you can show this ball how to have a good time. Chapter 66 Richard rested his back against a rock in the shade of a stand of white oaks as he gazed off at the line of silver maples shimmering in the breeze. The air smelled fresh after the rain of the day before. The clouds had moved on and left a clear, bright blue sky behind. His head finally felt clear as well. It had taken three days, but he was finally recovered from the effects of the poison. His gift had not only helped bring Kalin back from the brink, but himself as well. The people of the town of Witherton were just beginning to try to put their lives back together. With all the people they'd lost, it was going to be difficult for them. There were gaping holes where there used to be friends or members of families. Still, now that they were free, there was the beginning of a vibrant sense of their future being better. But just because they were free, that did not mean they would stay that way. Richard gazed up at the broad valley beyond the town. People were out working with their crops and tending to the animals. They were going back to their lives. He was impatient to be on his way and back to his own life. This place had kept them from important business, from people who had been waiting for them. He guessed that this place had been important business as well. It was hard telling what this all had begun or what the future would hold. For sure, the world would never be the same. Richard saw Kaylin coming out through the gate, Kara beside her. Betty frolicked along at their side, eager to see where they were going. Jensen must have let the goat go for a romp. Betty had grown up and spent her entire life on the move. She'd never stayed in one place for long. Maybe that was why she always wanted to follow Richard and Kaylin. She recognized family and wanted to be with them. So, what's she going to do? Richard asked Kaylin as she came close and set her pack down beside Richard's. I don't know. With the flat of her hand to her brow, Kaylin shielded her eyes from the sunlight. I think she wants to tell you first. Kara set her pack beside Kaylin's. I think she's torn and doesn't know what to do. How do you feel? Kaylin asked, as she reached down and with her fingertips rubbed the back of his shoulder. Her gentle touch was a calming connection. Richard smiled up at her. I keep telling you, I'm fine. He tore off a strip of dried venison and chewed as he watched Jensen, Tom, Owen, Marilee, Anson, and a small group of the men finally emerged through the gates and make their way across the waving field of waist-high green grass. I'm hungry, Kalen said. Can I have some? Sure. Richard pulled strips of the meat from his pack, stood, and handed a piece to both Kalen and Kara. Lord Rall, Anson said, waving as the group joined Richard, Kalen, and Kara in the shade of the oaks. We wanted to come out to say goodbye and see you off. Maybe we will walk with you toward the pass? Richard swallowed. We'd like that. Owen frowned. Lord Rall, why are you eating meat? You just healed your gift. Won't you harm your balance? Richard smiled. No, you see, incorrectly trying to apply a false notion of balance was what caused the problem I was having with my gift. Owen looked puzzled. What do you mean? You said that you must not eat meat as the balance to the killing you sometimes must do. After the battle at the fortification, don't you need to balance your gift all the more? Richard took a deep breath and let it out slowly as he gazed out over the mountains. You see, the thing is, Richard said, I owe you all an apology. You all listened to me, but I didn't listen to myself. Kaja Rang tried to help me with the words revealed on the statue, the words I told you. 
deserve victory. They were, first of all, meant for me. I don't understand, Anson said. I told you that your life is your own to live and that you have every right to defend it. Yet I was telling myself that I had to balance the killing I did to defend my life and the lives of my loved ones by not eating meat. In essence, saying my self-defense, my killing of those who attack me and other innocent people was morally wrong. And so for the killing I'd done, I needed to make amends to the magic that helped me by offering it the appeasement of balance. But your sword's magic didn't work either, Jensen said. No, it didn't. And that should have been the thing that made me realize what the problem was. Because both my gift and the sword's magic are different entities, yet they reacted logically to the same unreasoned action on my part. The sword's magic began to fail because I myself, by not eating meat, was saying that I did not completely believe that I was justified in using force to stop others who initiate violence. The sword's magic functions through the belief structure of the sword's owner. It only works against what the seeker himself perceives as the enemy. The sword's magic will not work against a friend. That was the key I should have understood. When I thought that the use of the sword had to be balanced, I was, in effect, expressing a belief that my actions were in some way unjustified. Therefore, because I held that remnant of faith in a false concept that had been inculcated in me throughout my life, just as all the people of Bondakar were taught, that killing was always wrong, the sword's magic began to fail me. The sword of truth's magic as my gift could only again be viable when I comprehended completely that the magic needs no balance for the killing I've done because the killing I've done is not only moral, but the only moral course of action I could have taken. By not eating meat, I was acknowledging that some part of my mind believed the same thing that the people here in Bondakar believed when we first met Owen and his men, that killing is always wrong. By thinking that I must not eat meat as a balance, I was denying the moral necessity of self-preservation, denying the essential of protecting the value of life. The very act of seeking balance for what I'm right in doing is a conflict which is what was causing the headaches and also caused the sword of truth's power to fail me. I was doing it to myself. Richard had violated the wizard's first rule by believing a lie that it was always wrong to kill because he feared it was true. He had also violated the second rule among others, but most grievous of all, he had violated the sixth rule. In so doing, he had ignored reason in favor of blind faith. The failure of his gift and the sword's power was a direct result of not applying reasoned thought. Fortunately, with the eighth rule, he had come to re-examine his actions and finally realized the flaw in his thinking. Only then was he able to correct the situation. In the end, he had fulfilled the eighth rule. Richard shifted his weight to the other foot as he gazed at the faces watching him. I had to come to understand that my actions are moral and need no balance but are in themselves balanced by my reasoned actions, that killing is sometimes not only justified, but the only right and moral thing to do. I had to come to understand the very thing I was asking all of you to understand. I had to understand that I must deserve victory. Owen looked over at those with him and then scratched his head. Well, considering everything, I guess we can understand how you could make such a misjudgment. Jensen, her red hair standing out against the green of the trees and fields, squinted at him in the sunlight. Well, she said with a sigh, I'm glad to be pristinely ungifted. Being a wizard sounds awfully hard. The men all nodded while voicing their agreement. Richard smiled at Jensen. A lot of things in life are hard to figure out, like what you've been considering. What have you decided? Jensen clasped her hands and glanced over at Owen, Anson, and all the rest of the people with them. Well, this is no longer a banished empire. It's no longer an empire naked to the aggression of tyrants. It's part of the Daharan Empire now. These people want the same as us. I think I'd like to stay with them for a while and help them come to be part of the wider world, just as I've been starting to do. It's kind of exciting. I'd like to take your suggestion, Richard, and help them in that. Richard smiled at his sister. 
he ran his hand down her beautiful red hair. On a condition, she added. Richard let his hand drop back. Condition? Sure. I'm a Rawl, so I was kind of thinking that I ought to have some proper protection. I could be a target, you know. People want to kill me. Jagang would love to. Richard laughed as he drew her into a hug with one arm to silence her. Tom, being as you are a protector to the house of Rawl, I'm assigning you to protect my sister, Jensen Rawl. It's an important job, and it means a great deal to me. Tom lifted an eyebrow. Are you sure, Lord Rawl? Jensen swatted him with the back of her hand. Of course he's sure. He wouldn't say it unless he was sure. You heard the lady, Richard said. I'm sure. The big blonde Daharan smiled with a boyish grin. All right, then. I swear I will protect her, Lord Rawl. Jensen gestured vaguely back at the men and the town behind her. Since I've been with them, they have come to see that I'm not a witch, and Betty is not a spirit guide, although for a time there I was afraid they might be right about Betty. Richard peered down at the goat. Betty cocked her head. I guess none of us but Betty knew the truth of what Nicholas was up to. At the sound of her name, Betty's ears pricked forward, and her tail went into a fit of expectant wagging. Jensen patted Betty's round middle. Now that these people understand that I'm not a witch, but I do share some of their traits, I suggested I might play an important role. She drew the knife at her belt and held it up, showing Richard the ornate letter R engraved on the silver handle. I suggested that I be the official representative of the House of Rawl, if you approve. Richard grinned. I think that's an excellent idea. I think that would be wonderful, Jensen. Kaylin pointed to the east with her chin. But don't wait too long before you get back to Houghton to see Anne and Nathan. They will be a valuable help in ensuring that the people here are no longer the prey of the Imperial Order. They will help you. Jensen twisted her fingers together. But aren't they going to want to be going with the both of you? Helping you? Anne thinks she should direct Richard's life, Kaylin said. I don't think some of her directions have been the best thing. She slipped her arm through Richard's. He is the Lord Rawl now. He needs to do things his way, not theirs. They both feel responsible for us, Richard explained. Nathan Rawl is a prophet. Prophecy, because of the way it functions, actually does require balance. The balance to prophecy is free will. I am the balance. I know those two don't like it, but I think I need to be free of them, for now at least. But there is more to it. I think it's more important that they help the people here first. We already know the uses to which Jagang will put the pristinely ungifted. I think it's vital that these people here, who are willing to value and protect the freedom they've won, are given some guidance in how to do that. Anne and Nathan will be able to set up defenses that will help protect the people here. They will also be valuable in teaching you the history that is important for you to know. After Richard picked up his pack and slipped his arms through the straps, Owen gripped Richard's hand. Thank you, Lord Rall, for showing me that my life is worth living. Marilee stepped forward and hugged him. Thank you for teaching Owen to be worthy of me. Richard laughed. Owen laughed. Kara gave Marilee an approving clap on the back, and then all the men laughed. Betty pushed in and with a flurry of tail wagging got the point across that she didn't want to be left out. Richard knelt down and scratched Betty's ears. And you, my friend, from now on, I don't want you letting any slides using you to spy on people. Betty pushed her head against his chest as he scratched her ears and bleated as if to say she was sorry. Chapter 67 Alone at last beneath the vast blue sky, the soaring walls of snow-capped mountains and in among the trees, Richard felt good about being on their way. He would miss Jensen, but it was only for a time. It would do her good to be on her own, yet among people also discovering how to live their own lives as they learned more about the wider world. He knew he would not trade away all he had learned since he'd left his sheltered life in Heartland. If not for that, he wouldn't be with Kalen. It felt good to walk and stretch his legs. 
He hitched his bow up higher on his shoulder as they made their way through the dappled sunlight of the hushed forest floor. After being so close to death as well as to losing his ability to see, he found everything more vibrant. The mosses looked more lush, the leaves more shimmery, the towering pines more awe-inspiring. Kaylin's eyes seemed more green, her hair softer, her smile warmer. As much as he at one time had hated the fact that he had been born gifted, he was now relieved to have his gift back. It was part of him, part of who he was, part of what made him the individual he was. Kaylin had once asked him if he wished she had been born without her confessor's power. He had told her that he would never wish that because he loved her for who she was. There was no way to separate out the parts of a person. That was to deny their individuality. He was no different. His gift was part of who he was. His abilities touched everything he did. His problem with his gift was of his own making. The magic of the sword of truth had helped him understand that by failing him. In so doing, it had revealed his own failure to recognize the truth. To have it back at his hip and to know that it was once again in harmony with him and ready to defend him and those he loved was a comforting feeling, not because he wished to fight, but because he wished to live. The day was warm, and they made good time climbing the rocky trail up into the pass. By the time they reached the crown of the notch through the formidable mountains, it was colder, but without a biting wind, it was not unpleasant. At the top of the pass, they stopped to gaze up at the statue of Kajarang, sitting where it had been for thousands of years, all alone, keeping vigil over an empire of those who once could not see evil. In some ways, the statue's presence was a monument of failure. Where Kaja Rong and his people had failed to get these people to see the truth, Richard had succeeded, but not without Kaja Rong's help. Richard put his hands on the cold granite, on the words Tauga Basternich, that had helped save his life. Thank you, he whispered up at the face of the man staring off toward the pillars of creation where Richard had discovered his sister. Kara placed her hands over the words, and Richard was surprised to see her look up at the statue and say, Thank you for helping to save Lord Rahl. After they started descending the pass, first crossing the open ledges and then making it down into the dense woods, Richard heard the call of a peewee the signal he had taught Kara that had served them so well. You know, Kara said, as she led them down the rocky ground beside a small stream, Anson knows a lot about birds. Richard stepped carefully among the tangle of cedar roots. Really? Yes. While you were recovering, we spent time talking. She put a hand against the fibrous bark of the reddish trunk of a cedar to keep her balance. She pulled her long blonde braid forward over her shoulder as she started out again, running her hand down the length of the braid. He complimented me on my bird whistle, Kara said. Richard glanced to Kalen. She shrugged to let him know that she didn't have any idea what Kara was getting at. I told you that you learned it well, Richard said. I told him that you taught it to me, that it was the call of the short-tailed pine hawk. Anson said that there wasn't any such bird as a short-tailed pine hawk. He said the call I used as a signal, the call you taught me, was a common wood peewee. Me, a moored Sith, using the call of a bird named a peewee. Imagine that. They walked in silence for a moment. Am I in trouble? Richard finally asked. Oh, yes, Kara answered. Richard couldn't help smiling, but he made sure the moored Sith didn't see it. Nor did Kara see Kalin look back over her shoulder with the special smile she gave no other but him. Kalin lifted an arm, pointing. Look! Through the gaps in the crowns of the cedars, against the bright blue sky, they saw a black-tipped race circling high above them, riding the mountain air currents. The races were no longer hunting them. This one was simply looking for its dinner. What's that old saying? Kara asked. Something about a bird of prey circling over you at the beginning of a journey being a warning sign. Yes, that's right, Richard said. But I'm not going to let that old tale bother me. 
We'll let you come with us anyway. Kalen laughed and received a scolding scowl. Kalen laughed all the more when Richard started laughing too. Kara couldn't hold out, and as she turned back to the trail, Richard saw the smile spread across her face. End of Naked Empire, The Sword of Truth, Book 8, by Terry Goodkind, read by Nick Sullivan.